I'm not tall enough. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Are we doing this right? I don't know. Hi. Hi. We're Arlen and RJ Taylor from Cedar Crest Trout Farms. Perfect. And puppies. <laughs> and puppies. <laughs> I think we'll just wait for a few people to tune in. Ooh. You can see our dogs for now. Puppies. We have eight viewers. We'll give it two minutes before we start. Hi, Kristen Garland. By the way, guys, this is our first time ever doing a Facebook Live photo or video, so if we're awful, well, thank you for being patient. Yes. It's not like it's not going to be posted for eternity on the Facebook. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also, my, my arms are long, but they're not quite that long, you know? Perfect. Okay. We'll just wait another minute. You can have a brief intermission and check out the newest addition to the Cedar Crest family. Oh, there we go. Oh, now all the visitor count climbs. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, well, why don't we get started? Okay. So. Okay, folks. So this is our first Facebook Live video, so bear with us. But uh, it's a nice day, so we're going to take a little wander around the farm. I'm RJ. And I'm Arlen. <laughs> oh, hi. And we're, we own Cedar Crest Trout Farms. Um, we are second generation. Our dad started this farm in 1995. And RJ and I, after uh, having a lot of fun in our 20s, decided to come back to roost in the 30s. It was never our intention. Um, but uh, here we are, and we'd like to show you around what we do on a semi-daily basis or every day with some added tricks as we go. Yeah, absolutely. So many of us know, many uh, of you know us as Cedar Crest Trout Farms, um, but we also go by the name Spring Hills Trout, um, which is because of all the fish boxes that we've been dropping off on people's doorsteps over the last few months. Uh, so welcome. So we're a network of five rainbow trout farms and a processing plant uh, here in Gray County. Uh, and I'll flip you around and Arlen will show you where we're gonna go for a little tour today. So at Cedar Crest, we kind of do it all. We have our brood stock, we raise fingerlings, we supply our own eggs, we supply eggs to others, um, and we also raise our own food production fish. So this is sort of a, an artistic rendition of what we uh, do here at Cedar Crest, starting with our beautiful waterways. Uh, each one of our five facilities has their own water source. They're all very dynamic and different, um, but they supply the amazing fish that we raise. Um, so here we have the eggs. Uh, we, we spawn all of our fish here on site. We run a very robust breeding program, which has about 5,000 parents. Um, we raise the eggs as they eye up and then they turn into a little what we call sack fry, um, which are these guys here, which are just as they sound. They've got their, their dominant, uh, dominant uh, abdomen, there we go. Their abdomen um, has their food supply for the first three weeks of their life, depending on water temperature. And then we uh, raise them up to be fry. We teach them how to eat um, commercial food that we, we supply for them, and we keep them on growing. Um, we, as far as fingerlings go, we raise between three and five million fingerlings each year. Um, some of these we keep for our own growth purposes. Others we ship to other land-based farms in Ontario, as well as a uh, the majority of them go out to the net pen farms in Georgian, in and around Georgian Bay. And uh, then you can see the, the big final fish that we have here that are either produced by ourselves or by the northern net pens um, or other land-based growers. So we'll take you for a, a little walk. Perfect. So many uh, don't know that in Ontario alone, we grow 100 million meals of farmed fish. That's 100 million meals. That's almost three meals for every Canadian. Um, and the majority of that fish is actually rainbow trout, very well suited to Ontario waters. Um, but we also grow Arctic char, barramundi, tilapia, we even grow some shrimp, um, and a few other species as well. So, so right now we're just wandering down. We can give you a little pan view. So you these- see our farm manager <laughs> about to release a turtle. Yeah, <laughs> that snuck into the farm. Excellent. So we're gonna go down and check out where it all starts with the 
the mamas and the papas are what we call our brood stock. Do, 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 do. So our lens is going to grab a net there. So a fish starts spawning in its third year, but it really gives the most eggs in its fourth and fifth and into its sixth years. Our lens just grabbing one there. Oh, hey. How old will this fish be, Arlen? Uh, this girl will turn five, Woo! five years <laughs> you old. You guys got a good view. Five years old in November. Excellent. Oh, we have a question about explaining what a fingerling is. Whoop! We can do one of these. Great. Um, you want to explain the location of the Yeah. So, if you hold that question, we're actually going to get there on our little tour. But these breeders right here, each one of those mamas and those papas, they're going to give us about five to 8,000 eggs once per year for about three to four years. So we take those eggs and each one of these, uh, these broodstock actually have an individual ID tag embedded under their top fin. We're scanning those, we're collecting the eggs, we're collecting the milk, and then we use sort of a, a big data approach. We look at how these fish have performed in terms of how fast they grow, how many live, uh, how resilient they are. Um, and we're looking at these fish and then all of the previous fish that they've, uh, that they've spawned. Um, and then we're using that to make decisions uh, on specific crosses between males and females, specific families, uh, to get specific traits. We know that if we're raising a fish here on our sites, we need a slightly different fish than one raised in the net pens in Northern Ontario. So those are the decisions we're making kind of in real time here on the farm. So, so we thought we'd uh, take you on a little wander. Doo -doo -doo. kind of see some of the raceways here. Okay, so we have some questions. How many males to females in each area? Um, in each family, it's about two-thirds females to one-third males in each one of the different strains that we carry, and we have nine different strains and different year classes within those strains. So with the trout families that we have on site, uh, four of them, I believe, date back to the very first trout that were ever cultured in Ontario in the 1950s. So it's 20 generations of trout that we've kept here in Ontario that are very well adjusted to the uh, sometimes very harsh growing conditions that we see here. So right now we're walking through our, food, our feed shed. So we get most of our feed uh, from New Brunswick as well as from our feed mill in Ontario. It's a very finely tuned diet. Uh, that gives them all the vitamins and minerals they need. So this is our early rearing area. And we're about to go into our incubation room. Doo -doo -doo. So in here is where we put all of the fish eggs. Da 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 da. So in this tray, we have about 8,000 trout eggs. So these eggs will sit in this tray for about one month at this water temperature before they do something called eye up. You actually start to see their eyes on the outside of the eggshell. Um, and then they, they sit for about another three to four weeks before they hatch. And we're gonna look at those really quickly. So these ones are a little bit older and they have already hatched. So if you remember, Arlen was talking about the yolk sacs that are still attached to their abdomen. You can actually see them right there. That's where all their nutrients come from before we start feeding them. Uh, we got a question about how many times their diet would be adjusted. Good question. You want to answer that one, Arlen? Yeah. Um, so they'll start off with a really high protein diet um, that they're on for until they're about a gram, almost two grams. And then we start lowering down the protein content as we fill up with a little bit more fat as that's what they require in their diet. Through their life cycle, when they're here with us at the farm as, as fingerlings, as we call them, which are those four to six inch fish, um, those guys will have already changed their diet about six times before they leave here. Um, so we're constantly monitoring it. We also use different companies at different sites 
um, because water quality parameters and different diets perform better in hot water and other diets perform better in cold water. So we're constantly adjusting it and working with the feed companies as well to ensure that we're getting not only optimal growth, but optimal health within our fish. Perfect. Okay. Let's see some of these babies swimming. So we have Heather here feeding. Hey, <laughs> As Arlen reminds me, this is a farm, not a movie set today. Want to show them some babies? Yeah. So you might be able to see here in the tank, Heather's just feeding them. You can see them shimmering across the surface. And uh, these guys are very busy eating. They eat, uh, these ones in here will eat between 8 and 15 times a day, depending on how big they are. When they're babies, smaller than these guys, um, they'll actually be eating between 15 and 20 times per day to make sure that we're giving them, have, they have the opportunity to eat when they're hungry. Not unlike a, a child that would be crying for a bottle, we make sure these guys are constantly being fed as well. So, these guys all have feet in the back, but here. Pull out a few of them. You can see these guys. So these guys are just at the one gram mark. So, so. they were spawned from their parents um, in December of this year, and they made their way out from the uh, from the incubators, which you guys saw in there in the middle of February. Perfect. Can I show them our, our newest edition. Oh yeah, absolutely. So we uh, always like to try and experiment with something new. So these ones here, it's a little bit hard to see them. I'll turn uh, my flashlight on. <laughs> so these are coho salmon. These are a type of fish. Um, we actually brought them in from Washington State. You can kind of see them swimming there. Oh, hey. So these are just babies. They grow a lot smaller. They grow a lot slower than the trout. This we've learned. But they don't like the light. So why are we trying these ones, Olin? Um, we're always looking at ways to make the Ontario aquaculture more diverse. Um, we've primarily raised rainbow trout for 30 years. Um, my dad started raising them in 1969. We've tried out a couple other species over the years, um, working with brook trout and brown trout, um, and, and what best complements our rainbow production. Um, so now we're primarily honed in, so to speak, on rainbows and arctic char, and cohos are the next species that we would like to attempt to commercially raise here in Ontario. Perfect. Uh, and so uh, we got a question from Crispin Colvin. Um, how big are they when they're shipped, and are you having any market challenges with so many restaurants and venues closed? Um, so when they're, they're shipped to the net pens, um, primarily they go anywhere as small as 25 grams, which is about a four inch fish. Um, up to our biggest guys are our super fingerlings, we call them, and they're 150 grams. That puts them at about 10 inches. Um, it depends on the site that they're going to and the production cycle that they'll be going into. With some of our land-based farms, when we ship them, we might ship them as small as, uh, say, two to four grams, so about double the size of the, the guys we showed you down there in the tanks. Um, and with our marketing uh, or with our food fish, um, it really depends. For land-based farms, we tend to raise a slightly smaller fish than, say, the net pens. We raise a fish that's between 1.5 and 2.2 pounds. Up uh, around the island and in Georgian Bay, they're raising fish of primarily to about three pound average, some as high as four, um, but they've raised the larger fish up there. Um, Mark, we're really fortunate here in Ontario that because of the Ontario population, uh, we have a really strong um, presence in the grocery stores and other boutique um, stores. So we haven't seen the major slumps. We've seen a, a lot of changes in the market who does the shopping, when they do the shopping. Yep. Um, it used to be that fish needed to be ready to be sold primarily on Fridays and Saturdays, and we're now seeing that trend changing to a Monday-Tuesday regime. Um, for us personally here on the farm, the venues that closed that affected us the most were fish out ponds and private lakes. Um, so we supply a lot of fish uh, to northern Quebec, um, where the private lodges, American tourists come up and go fishing. All those orders were cancelled uh, March 16th when, when everything happened. So in response to that, RJ and I, uh, well, we developed a company and uh, we are home delivering fish, so we're filleting them ourselves. 
and um, we're trying to keep up. The response has been incredible. The support is amazing. Um, however, it's uh, it, it's been interesting. Um, so now we're we've got our own production taken care of, and we're working with some other land-based farms that also felt the hit of COVID. So it's um, stay tuned. But so far, we're holding really strong. Um, Ontario is doing an incredible job at supporting local, um, which we couldn't be happier about. So. The amazing thing about aquaculture, I mean, we can I'll talk about this while we're walking. Um, the amazing thing about aquaculture is that we're able to take parts of um, the country or, or, or areas that are previously not generating food um, and, and using them to create food. So most of our five farms are on pieces of land that you really couldn't develop for any other purpose, except for maybe like a vacation property or something like that. Um, and we're using the natural springs, the river, um, pumping water, um, water off the escarpment, and we're using it to create food. The net pens uh, in Northern Ontario are the exact same thing. So um, our, our sector is a huge growth sector. We continue to see you know, expansion of 20, 25% every year. Um, but unfortunately, because of COVID, we've halted all our expansion projects. So that's really what's, uh, what's affecting us now. So excuse the truck passing. Gonna look at some fingerlings. Thank you for the question, though. Okay. So Relen's gonna show you some of these fingerlings we keep talking about, and you can say hi to Aaron and James. <laughs> so this guy is a hundred gram fish. He's about a year old. Um, he is scheduled to ship in about two weeks. Um, so they'll be heading up there a little bit behind up north again because of COVID. Um, but uh, we'll be holding on to these guys um, for an, a little bit longer than we had originally planned. But then they'll be headed up north. These are some of the bigger ones that we will be shipping. Um, across the farm, uh, in total right now on this facility, uh, and just in the outside portion of the facility, we have about 1.6 million fingerlings that are out here. Um, all in different sizes, different grades. We spend a lot of our time um, grading them to make sure that they're the proper size and they're within a good group. Um, we also have mechanized counters that we're running, none of which we're running today just because it uh, was not the day to run them, unfortunately. Otherwise, we'd love to show you that. RJ can later tell people where they can find out more about some of those activities. Um, so yeah, out here, it's, uh, it's kind of an, it's a one-of-a-kind system. Um, basically, we're pulling water off of and the water flows right through the farm, like an artificial river, and then it flows right back to the river and rejoins about a kilometer down. So we're we're the stewards of this environment while it's here with us. It's an excellent place to grow fish. Um, it also helps them adjust to their what will be their life in the cages, uh, or the net pens rather. Um, anything, we have temperatures that go down to freezing. Uh, in the winter will be 0.1 degree. This year was a very long winter. Uh, with snow on May the 9th, as I'm sure you will know. Um, and we'll get temperatures as high as 26, 27 degrees in summer. So it's managing the densities that are in the tank. So math is our, our number one thing here. We're constantly doing mathematical calculations um, to tell us um, how many fish are in the tank, how they're growing, we're weight sampling them, and we want to make sure that we're staying um, at the most optimal densities that they can be all the time. Uh, we had a question. Did you always know you wanted to take over the farm? Or hell, <laughs> hell no. Um, this was uh, not our, there's the man himself passing over behind us. Um, that crazy bugger started the farm uh, in 1995. RJ and I both left when we were 18. Uh, RJ went on for the, the typical life um, of, of wanting to go the university route. And uh, I did as much as I could to get out of the country as fast as possible. And I spent uh, 10 years in Africa um, and the Middle East. So my my dad asked me to come home. I was at the right place in my life that that seemed like a good opportunity. And then I asked RJ to come back almost three years ago um, because I, we were growing and it was too much for me. And I have a young son and I needed help. And I think because we grew up on the farm, we took a lot of what we were exposed to and a lot of the activities for granted. Um, but sort of by the time we both reached the end of our 20s, um, we were really exposed to enough of the rest of the world that we were able to see 
that aquaculture and agriculture in general is actually an incredibly progressive sector. Um, there is a lot of um, problem solving. Um, there's a lot of new technology. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to bring in new ideas, to bring in new technology, to bring in new processes. Um, and it's growing. People always need to eat. Um, and, uh, and especially uh, in a field like aquaculture, um, demand is soaring way faster than we can grow it. If we can grow it, uh, we can sell it for a fair price. Our problem is we just want to need to grow one, two, ten times more than we're currently growing. So. Yeah. Um, what were some of our other questions there? Okay, what were you doing in Africa in the Middle East? So, um, a little bit of everything and anything. Um, I started off as an HIV counselor. I uh, turned into an English teacher and then I turned into a logistician um, and a negotiator. Um, I did a lot, I wore a lot of different hats. Um, I think being raised on a fish farm taught me a lot of different hats and, and uh, I kept using that and then brought it back again once I sort of explored. Uh, we had a question here, why don't we end by the river over here? Uh, we had a question about what our favorite thing is about farming. So we might have different answers on this one, but I think I have a couple answers. The first one is um, because of COVID, we've actually been selling a lot of fish direct to customers uh, through Facebook and phone calls and emails. Whoop, there we the um, and I absolutely love talking with anybody that will talk to me about fish farming. Um, we get a lot of questions, a lot of the, the questions about farm versus wild, about antibiotic usage, about sustainability and environmental impact. And I, I, I think it's one of my favorite parts of the job um, is, is education. So. Yeah. Um, my favorite thing about farming is the lifestyle. Um, I like to be busy all the time. It allows me to do that, but it also allows me to raise my family here, uh, be with my family. You know, uh, many siblings would think it's corny to say, but my brother is my best friend and uh, I get to be with him every day and beat him occasionally, which is helpful. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's the lifestyle, um, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also our team here. Uh, most of the people that work on our farms are site leads and, and, and everyone's supporting them. Um, they've been with us for many, many years, some as many as 30 years. Yeah. Um, and they, they are really what make every day uh, amazing. So, yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions? Farm what it, versus wild. Oh, what are your thoughts on farm versus wild? Excellent, excellent question. Um, so the way I like to describe this one um, is that as, a, as, as someone who myself goes to the grocery store um, and stands in front of a seafood counter that has like 25 different kinds of fish, how the heck are you going to choose them all? What's, what's the difference? Um, I, as a consumer myself, I find the farm versus wild uh, question um, not very useful. Um, in sort of the three years that I've been back on the farm, um, I've learned worldwide um, that there are some very well-run fish farms, um, and there are also some very poor-run fish farms. Um, but I've also learned that when it comes to wild, there's actually some very well-managed wild fish stocks, but there's also some very mismanaged uh, wild fish stocks in, in polluted areas that face a lot, a lot of issues. So what I recommend is always looking for some sort of sustainability certification. Um, our farms are actually the only land-based farms in Ontario that have best aquaculture practices certification. We're also ocean-wise recommended. And that actually means that we have auditors on site pouring over all of our activities to make sure that everything we're doing is in the best interest of our fish, in the best interest of the environment, and in the best interest of our staff here. Um, and there are certifications for wild fish stocks as well. Uh, that will tell you if, if a wild fish population is being sort of sustainably harvest um, and from a, an unpolluted area. So that's, uh, that's what I recommend and a lot of grocery stores um, really like to celebrate those, uh, those certifications. So you'll probably see them loud and proud. So, okay. So I think there was another question about water quality. Oh yeah. Yes. So um, to answer the water quality question, um, water quality is top of mind. Um, we are looking at it not only from an MOE perspective, the MOE would have us check into making sure about uh, suspended solids and total phosphorus counts, but together with our eco certification that we have, which is BAP, we check a lot more than that. We're checking oxygen content for the amount that we're using or we're putting back in. 
and, and looking at it. The one thing that's been really interesting is that Camp Creek, um, the water source which we take from for this farm, actually has three fish farms um, on it using or, or um, util utilizing the water or putting more water into it. And it's still one of the healthiest cold water streams in all of Ontario. Um, so we're constantly checking, we're doing monthly water samples, we're doing daily water counts to make sure that our oxygen is in place, we're not sapping the environment. And because of the farm being here, RJ kind of gave a picture of it earlier, but um, this is our discharge channel, which is where all the water flows back into Camp Creek, and it is almost, it almost acts as though it's like a sanctuary. So there's brown trout and brook trout, and there's plants and ducks, and it's this vibrant, beautiful land um, that's so busy um, and, and it's really more for us it's about the ecosystem management we need this river to maintain itself as healthy as long as it can and as much as we can do to support it we also work together with trout unlimited to do a lot of stream rehabilitation both above us and below us just to make sure that we can repair some of the wrongs that have been done um, in the past with dam building and people playing around with rocks and things like that and we're trying to keep it as healthy as we can and combat climate change the best that we can so I think uh, that's all we have for today. Oh, what advice would you have for someone interested in studying aquaculture or a career in aquaculture? Um, so ironically, I, am, I, I teach part of the course at uh, Fleming College for up and coming aquaculture technicians. Um, the reality is, is that it's, it's a hard business, it's farming. Um, so it, it's not a nine to five job, um, it's very busy. It's very dynamic. You can have slow periods and busy periods, just like any other form of oh, RJ. Oh, sorry. Um, any other form of, of things, but uh, a passion for fish and, and an attitude that you can just keep fighting is really what you need. Um, it's a highly innovative, interesting um, career path to take. It's not for everyone. Um, but it is uh, something that we greatly enjoy and as RJ told you about his experience in aquaculture versus mine they're very different you can make whatever you want out of it yeah there's a couple really really good things that that again things I used to take for granted but as I kind of went out and worked elsewhere I realized aren't the case one you get to spend a lot of time outside most often you spend more time outside in summer which is nice but you also get to spend some time outside in winter um, Another great thing is, is almost everyone that works on the farms brings their dogs to work every day, uh, which is really, really fun. Um, and also, we're just a really close community here on the farm, and you'll find that with a lot of other farms and fish farms. Um, you know, it's not like we all race home at the end of the day. We're often sort of enjoying uh, Friday afternoons, Friday evenings together um, as well. And, and also, it's, it's really seasonal from the sense of like, you're never really doing the same thing over and over all year long. It really does change throughout the year, which is a really nice sort of ebb and flow to, to how things work here. So, yeah. excellent. So. so on that note, guys, thank you. Um, thank you for tuning in and uh, seeing our first attempt at a Facebook Live. And uh, yeah, you can Perfect. look for more information yep. on us on either YouTube or Facebook. We're kind of plastered all over the place yep. and we're happy more questions at any time. Yep. You can go to ontarioseafoodfarmers.ca or springhillstrout.ca. There's a whole bunch of more video tours and stuff as well. Maybe when we're not uh, receiving sheds and, and oxygen. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye everyone.